take your Bibles this morning and open to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture with Paul and Silas. Uh, we're involved in Paul's second missionary journey here as he's uh, up to Macedonia, and he's going through Macedonia, and he lands at uh, Philippi. Uh, there where the Philippian church and believers would start. But he's uh, in Philippi with Silas here and uh, running into some things that uh, you and I run into in our lives every day. And uh, we're going to have those dark times. Anybody have any dark times in your life? Yeah, how many? Uh, sometimes weekly, aren't they? And don't you notice sometimes that sometimes they come one right after another? I mean, one trial or test, whatever you want to call it, one dark time in your life, and boy, here comes another one, here's another one. And you sometimes, hey, man, I need a little break, you know, a little retrieve here. Um, you know, lighten up a little bit. That's what I tell the Lord, respectfully. You have to say, hey, man, I need, I need a little break. How about lightening up a little bit? And, uh, and so we, we go through those dark times. And by the way, you're in the race. And along the path and the trail... There's going to be some dark days and dark times. You ever gone out at night walking and it's dark? It's dark at night. Not too many lights out. And you notice sometimes maybe you, you walk the same path you walk in the daytime. And everything at night seems a little different. And you hear sounds that, you, that were there in the daytime, but they're different at night. And you hear creepy things and things that pop and scare you a little bit. And sometimes you uh, start moving a little faster, uh, trying to get to some light. Uh, or if you're walking the same path and all of a sudden you stumble and you say, well, where did that come from? You know, I walk this path every day. Now all of a sudden I'm running into something or falling into something. It's, it's just different at night. And the sounds are different. And, and those dark times come. You know, we can't always live in a sunny day. It's not always going to be sunshine. And sometimes there's going to be some dark times in our lives and on the way in this path that we run. And uh, Paul and Silas are running a path. They're on Paul's uh, second missionary journey. And they've arrived and gone up to Macedonia. That's a, a gateway to Europe up at the top there. And then, then you come on down and you come into Berean and Corinth, Corinth and all down in the southern end there. But as you go into there, Philippi there, and there's where he's at with his second missionary journey. And then he and Paul, uh, Silas, are going to run into some, some dark times. And you're going to have dark times in your life. And, uh, and what do we do? What do we do when the dark times come? Well, we're going to have to learn how to rejoice. Uh, that's easier said than done, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier said than done when it comes time to rejoice in the dark days. But we're going to look at uh, five things here real quickly uh, that these guys were experiencing. And uh, you'll find out that probably you've gone through some yourself. You may be going through some even now. And it's uh, brought on a dark day, dark time in your life. And so how are we going to get through it? And so we're going to see here as we begin. So Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word once again as we get a chance to take a look at it and study it this morning together as a class here at our church. And we thank you for your wisdom and the Holy Spirit that guides us and directs us, teaches us, brings into remembrance all things Jesus has said to us. He gives us light and illumination and understanding, and then we ask for wisdom to apply it. So as we take a look at Paul and Silas are having a dark day. They're having a dark time in their life and in their journey and their race of life uh, as even serving in the ministry. Uh, there are dark times and dark days and and how can we deal with it? And we know what to do. So we're going to take a look at it this morning. Lord, give us uh, wisdom and understanding now. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide. And please be with our church. We have so many people out that are sick, Lord, and going through sickness. And we ask you to put your healing hand upon them and bring them back safely to us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're not going to read all these verses 16 through 34. For there's this, the passage we're looking at, but we're going to pick it up here and begin. And uh, by the way, this is their second missionary journey, and uh, 
the, the testimony of Paul and Silas is what we're looking at here, and we happen to be at Philippi right now, and uh, uh, we're going to take a look, and we're going to learn that in the dark days, in the dark times we have, we are to be our testimony that is we ought to be displaying and manifesting rejoicing. There ought to be a time of rejoicing. In Philippians 4, 4, Paul says, Rejoice always in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. Philippians 4, 4. Do what? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The key word in that verse is the word always. The what? Always. What does always mean? Always. Okay? Always. Even in the dark times. Always rejoice. What did Jesus say in John 16, 33? He said, you're going to have tribulation in this world. He said, you're going to have it. And so you're going to go through tribulation, every one of us. And sometimes it's, uh, and those are the dark times. And Jesus said that we're going to have that. And what did James tell us in James 1.12? Or 1 to verse 2. Verse 2 in James chapter 1 and verse 2. He starts right off the bat. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Trials, testings, various ones, many of them. He says, rejoice. And so that's the spirit and the attitude that we ought to display and manifest in our lives when we go through these dark times. And we're going to have them. Along the path, along the trail, you're going to have dark times in the race that you're running. And so let's take a look at, at some of the five that these guys are experiencing and we'll try to apply them to us today. All right, let's try to make an application out of this as to uh, the very things that Paul and Silas were experiencing. You and I are going to experience the thing, same things, right? All right, so let's begin to look at the first one here, beginning in verse number 16 uh, of our text tonight. Uh, let's take it this morning, look at it. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. Now notice they had gone to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, that is Silas, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. I mean, can you imagine? And this is what the demon is saying about them, okay? And this uh, did she did this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and he came out the same hour. And so the first thing we see here is they're faced with a spirit of divination. And you go, well, I don't know that I'm facing a spirit of divination in my dark times. Well, when it's a spirit of divination, that's a demon. Okay? They were facing a demon. And uh, and, and demonic uh, demon was uh, agitating them and bothering them. And uh, how else could we call that today as a believer? Paul made it clear in Ephesians chapter 6 that but what? We're not fighting flesh and blood, but we're fighting principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. In other words, you're in a spiritual warfare. And you see, and so... You say, well, there ain't no demon of devastation after me. <laughs> no, you're in a spiritual warfare. And a spiritual warfare is against powers and principalities and so forth. They're not people. Your battle's not with human beings. The battle is with demonic spirits and can trouble you. And, and you face that. And believe me, when they come and that happens, it's a dark time. And that's why Paul says we're in a spiritual warfare. That's why it's necessary you get dressed in the armor of God so that you can stand against those wiles of the devil and the scams and the darts that he's firing at, firing at you. And, and you're going to get in that dark time. And you need to realize and recognize that, hey, wait a minute. This is a spiritual battle going on. This is spiritual warfare. And so what you need to be doing is rejoicing. And I said, and that's easy to say, isn't it? It is. We've all been there, and when we're in those dark times, we don't feel like rejoicing. I mean, let's be honest. I don't see you going around praising the Lord. Hallelujah, I'm being attacked by a demon. You know, this is fantastic. I love it. <laughs> oh, man, bring it on. I, do you all do that? No, I don't do that, and you don't either. 
And so there are going to be those times you're going to find yourself in a dark time. You're in a spiritual warfare. You're in a battle with demonic powers. And folks, they're real. Okay? Well, let's look at something else that they were involved in. In verses, and see if we can go through some of this. In verses 19 through 22. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. So you got to understand there in the, uh, Philippi was in the, in the providence of Rome, one of Rome's providence that Rome ruled. These are Gentiles, and guess who's come into town? Jews. Gentiles didn't like Jews, and Jews didn't like Gentiles. Matter of fact, during this time under Rome and, and here in the, this area here, this providence of Rome of Philippi, there was a lot of anti-Jewish Semitism going on. In other words, we can call it discrimination. Our, our, our deception, the, 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 the statement of deception, uh, we could cause this. It was that there were, these guys were being accused of deception, of teaching something that they weren't accustomed to. And so they were, were being, they were, have you been accused of something? You ever had people start accusing you of things? Things you didn't even do? Things you weren't involved in? Or whatever it was that you were doing, you were trying to do something that's right? And something that's scriptural, biblical, to the best of your ability. And then you've got a, a class of people or a group of people or someone attacking you. And, and you know, that you're, you're, you're bringing a deception in. I mean, look, he says, man, these guys are teaching stuff that, uh, hey, this, these are, you know, the, the, these, the, these, the, these are rules and, and, and so forth. And these customs, are, they're not lawful for us to receive. And so they were bringing this deception against them. But look at verse 20, which we read. And brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, now this wasn't being something really kind and nice to them. Oh, by the way, these fellows happen to be Jewish men. No, this was, a, you might call racism back in those days. These guys are Jews, and we don't like Jews, and we don't want them in our town. All right, and they're, they're teaching this deception of these customs and course. What was they teaching? Salvation. So you're going to get in trouble when you serve the Lord. You stand up for the Lord and speak for the Lord and try to share the gospel. Believe me, the, the devil's going to attack. And people are going to accuse you of, of, of trying to deceive them into something of this deception. And then discrimination. How many people have discriminated against you saying you are a Christian? Well, he or she's a Christian. That's one of those Bible believers. There's a Jesus freak, a Jesus thumper, Bible thumper. Or you get into it with them and say, well, you're supposed to be a Christian. Look at you, look at the way you're acting, and blah, blah, this or that. They don't take into account that they're causing you to act that way. You see, because it's not their fault, it's your fault. So they accuse you. Anybody any, ever been accused of being a Christian? You ever been accused of being a believer for standing up for the Lord and somebody accused you of that? Yeah, and, and, and that kind of goes on, and you know what? And especially when you're outnumbered, you've you got a dark day going on. Times of darkness, and it's kind of hard sometimes to rejoice in the Lord. Uh, you know, there's a disciple of Christ, there's a follower of Jesus. There's one of those Jesus freaks. Well, they were accusing these guys. You guys are social discrimination. And boy, are we going through it today, aren't we? There is such social discrimination today against the church. And I'm talking about the church of the living God, against believers, those that live for the Lord, trying to live for the Lord. Social discrimination is on a tremendous rise. And, and these things will come to you and I. And guess what? Uh, we find ourselves in a dark time. You know, I, I wouldn't count on this today in my race. This wasn't on my game plan. This wasn't on the, the map I laid out to run my race today. But yet, you find yourself in a dark time because you're a Christian and somebody's discriminating against you because you love the Lord and trying to live for Him and serve Him. And, and that's going to come. And then people are going to accuse you of, of bringing false uh, uh, doctrine in. 
They were sharing Christ, and they said, hey, we, we're not, we're not, we don't go for this. We don't take this here. And they brought them before the magistrates and all of these accusations going on. And then they're fighting the demon at the same time. See, it all started out with a demonic spirit. That led to this, which led to them gra- grabbing them and taking them to the, before the judges, the magistrates. You see, just one step after another in their day. They were having some dark times. It was like one trial after another. First, we had to deal with a demon. Paul had to deal with that, and he rebuked it, and it came out. And did you notice the scripture said it came out in the same hour? Not like a lot of the stuff you see today. Instant presto. You know, jumping off the platform, doing somersaults and all that kind of stuff, nonsense. It's amazing, isn't it? And then just uh, being accused. You ever been accused of sharing the gospel? Trying to tell somebody about the Lord? Share your faith, your beliefs, and, and, and they don't agree with that. And especially in the workplace or the school place, and then you got, what do you have? You have the worms. How many of you met a worm in school? You know who the worms were, don't you? They were the snitchers and the tattletalers, and they'd go tell the teachers, the administration, you know, he's over there, she's over there, and they're passing out these gospel tracts, you know, and they're trying to tell us about Jesus, and they got a Bible, and that's big time today, boy. You, you don't do stuff like that. When we were kids going to school, that was welcomed. I mean, we had no problem with that. And our high school especially had 4,000 students in our high school. This would be in 1966, 67, 68. Man, Dr. Uh, uh, Bogey, and he was cool, cool principal. And uh, I got to know him, and he's a great guy. And, you know, before you, you know, when you go to school, you always go to homeroom. You got to go to homeroom for 15 minutes of homeroom, and you go through the pledge and, and allegiance and, and salute and sing and all forth. And then, of course, you come with a PA system in our school, we'd have a Bible reading and prayer. And, uh, and I got to do that. So I got to know Mr. Bonnie, the principal of the school, and so forth. And then we go in the school cafeteria, and if you started first, first shift, which we did, 7.15, our first classes, so we were there like 6 o'clock in the morning in the school cafeteria. And we'd be in there, and there'd be tables everywhere, Bible clubs, kids having Bible studies. I mean, we could stand up on top of the table in the cafeteria and share the gospel. I mean, we, we could do that. This isn't public school. Try that today and see what happens. I mean, you, we, kids that, that love the Lord and were in the Bible clubs, David, it'd be their top book on their books as they carry their books in their arms. and their, The Bible would be on the top of all the books. And you go into your classroom, you set your Bible on your desk, and the teachers had one on their desk, and we had Ten Commandments in the classroom. I mean, all this kind of stuff. Try all that stuff today and see what happens. You know, and it's coming back, at least praise the Lord. But even then you'd get ridiculed sometimes and, and, and they would report you to the teacher or something and, and of course I loved it when they did want to do that and they'd take it to Mr. Bonnie, our principal. I knew I was safe and he was going to protect me. I mean, <laughs> Mr. Bonnie was on my side, David. <laughs> I had the principal. <laughs> and so, but uh, it happens in the workplace today. You try to be a Christian for God in the place, the workplace today, share your faith in a track, and I'll tell you what, people are going to uh, go and complain about you, that you, you know, that this deception material that you're giving out, deceiving people, and so forth, and then, and by the way, they're a Christian, they're a believer. And it's interesting, they're the only ones that get accusations brought against them. You can be any other religion if you want, and they don't say a word. You can go in our public school, schools today and you can pr- promote Islam and, all, and not a word is said. But you try to promote Christianity and Jesus, oh, you're in trouble. You're gonna, and you, you know what? You're going to face a dark time in those dark days. And you're going to say, well, I don't understand this, God. I'm trying to live for you, trying to serve you the best I can. No, I'm not perfect. I'm not super Christian. But, man, why, why are all these dark days I'm having? Uh, demons I'm fighting. I'm being accused, wrongly accused of this and that, of trying to share my faith and, and to live my faith. And, 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 and now, you know, and then they're blaming me for being a disciple of Jesus. And then look at verse 22, what happens to them. And the multitude rose up together against them. You ever had the multitude rise up together against you? Hey, folks, well, there's two or more. That's a multitude. You know, if there's three or four in your house and there's three against one, that's a multitude. Okay? Simple as that. Same thing with workplace, whatever, uh, there. And he says, and they rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. 
they were, now you got to keep in mind here, they were in a Roman providence, right? These are Gentiles under Roman control, and they're accusing these guys of being Jews, but the one thing they forgot, Paul was a Roman. And they brought these men uh, and had them flogged, okay? In other words, they sentenced them without a defense. They had no attorney. They had no one to speak up for them. They flat passed a sentence on them without any kind of defense. And today's the same thing in your dark days sometimes. You're going to be accused of all kinds of things, and you have no way of defending yourself or putting up a defense. And the next thing you know, a sentence is passed. Now, not in this particular passage, but there was another time when Rome, and Paul just reminded him, says, by the way, I am a Roman citizen. I have a right to an attorney. I have a right to a defense. And you have done a wrong thing here. And boy, did they get silent right quick. But here they took and they beat these guys. Now, this was an unlawful thing. And the thing was, is they were being punished. They were being disciplined. They were being chastised for doing the right thing. You ever got in trouble for doing the right thing? You ever had a sentence passed on you uh, for doing the right thing? It'll come. It'll happen. It'll be a dark day in your life and in a dark time. And you'll say, I don't understand this. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't breaking the law. Why am I being uh, disciplined or punished or sentenced for this, for something I have done have not done? And it, it happens. There's no defense. Nobody to defend them. And then not only in this, they said, boy, then, then they got, not only did they that, but then look at what else happened to them. They were scourged, and then they were put in detention. Look at verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, he thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. All for just sharing Christ in the town of Philippi. Your workplace, your school, if you're kids in school, college students, whatever, place of business where you work, your neighborhood, you know, here you are. Now you've gotten a detention, you've gotten whipped and a detention, and it wasn't bad enough to be getting put in jail. Now you're thrown into the inner prison where it was nothing but a dark hole. And you're going to have those dark days in your life. And you're going to feel like you're in prison. And uh, you're going to feel like, wow, man, uh, these guys are, are paying a price for something they didn't do. Paying a price for something they were guilty of that they didn't do. Paying a price for serving their Lord. And there'll come dark times, folks, just because you're saved and a Christian. And I don't care even if you're in the ministry, there are dark days going to come for serving Christ. The enemy will come against you and accuse you and all kinds of things. And it's just, it's, it's uh, unreal. And so you may face divination, deception, discrimination without defense, and now a detention. All for something of just trying to serve the Lord, be a Christian, be a witness, be a testimony in your surrounding. Your home, your family, your school, your place of work, wherever. There's a price sometimes that has to be paid. And you're going to think, wow, this is some dark days, man. I mean, not only is it dark, now I'm in the inner dungeon. And I've listened to pastors that have gone over to Israel and had an opportunity and go places like Philippi and, and go into some of these places of these jails and dungeons that are still there. And, and, and they said, man, the, the, the horrible the horrible treatment and the stench uh, it was just inhumane. All simply because you came into town to tell some Roman citizens, some Gentiles, the gospel. And you went through this kind of treatment. And you might be feeling that way even today, whether you're at home, your family, school, business, work, well, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. And you're trying to run your race to the best of your ability. And now you find yourself in a dark day. How many of you think these guys were in a dark day? 
Here they were excited. You know, they were thrilled. We're going on a mission trip. Hey, man, I can't wait. We're going on it. I'm traveling with the Apostle Paul of all people, and we're going to Philippi, and we're going to take the gospel, and we're going to hand out tracts, and we're going to start talking to people about Jesus and, and sharing the gospel. And the next thing you know, you find yourself in a dark dungeon hole. And you're thinking, hey, wait a minute. This isn't what I had in plan. This isn't what I had in mind. This wasn't in my game plan today, and I certainly didn't plan this on my trip. Remember, you're in a race, you're in a journey, and this wasn't it, and now you find yourself in some very dark days, and you go, what do I do? What do I do? How do I deal with this? How do I handle this? Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. You're gonna have the dark times, folks, that are coming. Well, let's see how the Apostle Paul and his partner, Silas, handled this whole situation. Let's take a look at the spirit of Paul and Silas. Let's look at their spirit. You see, your spirit ought to manifest and display something in your life if you're truly saved and born again. Here it is. And at midnight, verse 25, now remember where they're at, what's going on. You know, they, it's not a big lit city like we have here, a metropolitan city there in Philippi, and we got the freeways and the interstates, and we got all kinds of lights and electricity. I mean, after sundown, it's dark. There's no lights. Some of them may have some candles and a few kerosene lamps, but, you know, you don't have that. So all of this had to take place in the daytime. The arrest had to be taken in the daytime. So someplace we could figure maybe around six o'clock at sundown, they were put into prison. So they've been in prison basically about six hours. And now the clock has struck midnight. At the midnight cry, he's coming. Hallelujah. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, what? You've got to be kidding me. Prayed. What? How did they handle this? What was the spirit of Paul and Silas after all that they had went through and what had happened to them? The Bible said they prayed. Now remember, the word here prayed is in, in the text here. It is implying that it was a continual praying. So they were thrown in at 6 p.m., let's say. So midnight, they've been in a prayer for about six hours. You know, the problem with us, we pray six minutes if we're lucky. They kept on praying. And so about six hours of praying, the apostle probably said, Hey, Silas, it's about time for us to start singing. Amen. Look what they did. They prayed and they sang praises unto God. And look what the results of part of that was. And the prisoners heard them. The spirit of Paul and Silas was two things. They prayed and they sang praises. This is how they handled the dark day and the dark time in their life. They were praying, took a break. Now it's time to praise the Lord. And they started singing hymns. Huh? I don't think they sang this contemporary stuff that's out there. They sang hymns. Lord, how great thou art, maybe. You know? The doxology. I mean, they, they sang hymns of praise. When's the last time in your dark day and my dark day we've taken time out to say, you know, it's time to go to prayer. And I need to pray. I'm in a spiritual battle of warfare. I'm being accused, falsely accused, of some type of false deception. I'm being discriminated against because I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. So people are discriminating against me. They're sentencing me, you know, for whatever that sentence may be, discipline, punishment, when I haven't done anything wrong. and They haven't allowed me to defend myself or to bring my case up whatsoever. And now they've done beat me and thrown me in the inner jail. Wow. This ain't fair. 
Isn't that how we think? This isn't just. This isn't right. But what did Paul and Silas do, church? They prayed. Why do we always wait to the end to do that? And they prayed and they prayed. And so they took a little break. Let's get a hymn going here. Let's do some singing. You know, usually when you start singing, people start listening. That's exactly what we see here. The prisoners heard them. Now, the prisoners knew that the reason why they were in there, and I'm sure they heard their story and what happened to them, and they're probably thinking the same thing. This wasn't right for them to do that to them and so forth. And yet, here they are, beaten, bloodied from a scourging, and now they're in here, and they've been praying for six hours over there, and now they're singing. See, their, their spirit was one of prayer and singing in the darkest hour of their life. Down in the dungeon, the hole. That was their spirit. See, our joy comes from the Lord. James 1, 2, and 3, and 4, we could read there and talk about, you know, rejoice again and say rejoice, and brethren, count it all joy, and you fall into divers temptations. And Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, talk about that very thing, about having joy during this time. And so that's what they got to see in your life and in my life. We can't see us complaining and whining and fussing and wanting to fight and bicker and argue and everything else and getting mad and angry. And, and, and that's usually our response, isn't it? And instead of relaxing and just saying, okay, I need to take this to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to let him handle this, and we're going to take it to God in prayer. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray more than what, five minutes. You know, you're in a dark day. This is a dark time in your life. It's going to take a little bit more than, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. My soul I pray the Lord to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Amen. Oh, you're going to need a little more time than that. These guys took six hours to talk to the Lord about it. There was some kind of prayer meeting going on. But you see, things begin to happen. When you move heaven, look out, get ready, because something big's about to happen. But you've got to have the right spirit and the right attitude. And the right spirit was praying and singing praises unto the Lord. And then some great and wonderful things are about to happen. Now think about the situation you're in, where it's at, whether it be at work, school, play, family, whatever. They're watching you. They're listening to you. And you're wondering if anything's going to happen or come from this. Well, let's see if that happened. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. I'd say something big's about ready to happen, wouldn't you? So that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Hey, something big happened. Right? Okay, fantastic. And the, and lo loosed, and the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep, I guess it would waken him. Seeing the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Scholars believe that probably most of those prisoners got saved while Paul and them were down. See, God put those men in a place to reach people that couldn't hear him in the city. See, they couldn't hear him in the town street. They couldn't hear him in the synagogue. They're in a prison, so God puts two of his men in prison for a little while so that those prisoners could hear the gospel and get saved. God has you in a place where people need to hear the gospel. And sometimes before they hear it, they need to see it. In your attitude, in your spirit, and how do you respond, and so forth, in prayer. And then God begins to move, and great things are about to happen. And so, man, all those guys were there. Nobody flew. If you were in prison in jail and the jail's broke open and the guard kills himself, you're thinking, man, we got a way to escape. We can get out of here. It's at midnight at night. No other guards are around. Let's get out of here. Wouldn't that happen over low where you were at, David? Something like that happened? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but hey, guess what? We're all here. My goodness. Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do thyself no harm, we're all here. Then he called for a light, and he sprang in, and he came in trembling, and he fell down before Paul and Silas, and he, and, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
See, not only did the jail, not only did the prisoners need to get saved, but the jailer needed to get saved. And the only way they were going to get saved down in a dungeon in his hole, God had to take his two missionaries and put them in jail. It was a dark day, but a dark day turned to rejoicing and praising God. And the jailer got saved, and they said on him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. In other words, the third point this morning is, you see, there's a suffering at Philippi. You're going to go through some suffering. There's going to be some dark days. But you've got to have the right spirit. And it's the spirit of prayer and praise, singing. And then as a result, there was salvation the Philippian jailer. In other words, you see, folks, there's hope in Jesus. Even for the people around you. The people at the office, the people at the workplace, the people at school, the people in your business, the people in your family, you know, whatever. There's hope in Jesus. And the jailer got saved. The prisoners got saved. Not only that, remember Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And later what did he do? He took them home. He washed their stripes, cleaned them up, took them to home, gave them something to eat, and his whole household got saved. You know how many was in that jailer's household? Forty-two. So not only did the prisoners get saved, not only did the jailer get saved, his whole house got saved, his whole family was saved because of the testimony and the spirit of Paul and Silas and how they handled a dark day in their life. Going to have some dark times in your life. Let's forget them. He brought them in and he says, and he believed and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord. (laughs) <laughs> they shared the gospel with him and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. And he and all his, his whole family, got saved and baptized. And when he had brought them to, into his house, he set me before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. Now there's no doubt Paul and Silas had no idea that all this was in the plan that day. It didn't start out too good. Several days have gone by because this lady tormented them for three or four days, several days followed them, saying these men are, you know, sharing this, preaching this gospel of Jesus around here, the spirit of divination. So there's a warfare, spiritual warfare going on. Paul had to deal with that. And then they're accused of things, and then they're discriminated because they're Jews in a Gentile situation. Then, they, then they're brought with charges before without any kind of defense. Then they're beaten half to death and thrown into the end of prison. I'd say that's a bad day at bedrock, right? You ever had a bad day like that? You ever gone through some dark times like that? Maybe not quite as dark. But there was five things there. Maybe you've been in spiritual warfare. You've had that dark day. Maybe it's been a time where people have accused you of spreading uh, false doctrine or teaching. Maybe there was a time when somebody discriminated against you in the house, the home, the workplace, or whatever, because you were a Christian. Maybe there was times when you got sentenced by the boss, the school principal, when you did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing, and then you served detention. Most of us in school, in junior high and high school, raise your hand, how many of you ever went to detention? Come on, George, I know you did. You put that hand up high. You better, I've heard your story. You better put that hand up high. I know you did. You know, spend some time in detention. And for us, most of the time in school, we went to detention because we were doing something wrong. <laughs> Not doing what's right. But anyway. And so, verses 30 through 33, we see, folks, there's hope in Jesus. There's hope in Jesus. For your loved ones, your family, your friends, your neighbors, classmates, school, workspace. There's always hope in Christ. And in the the results, there's going to be rejoicing. Rejoicing. So, the dark days will come. Pray and rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. And then rejoice when the dark days come. They're going to come. Maybe in some right now. Try putting this to practice. And then trust God to see what's done. It would be amazing. Who knows how many prisons were in there, the household. Before this whole thing was over with, David, 50 or 60 people got saved. It's fantastic. 
Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word of comfort, your word of instruction. Thank you for these examples that you give us. Uh, these men, missionaries on a mission trip, end up going through some dark days in their life, some dark times in their path, their travel, their race that they're running. And man, but they had a great spirit about them. And they displayed that spirit through rejoicing and praying. And as a result, some wonderful things were done and accomplished for Christ, to whom we give God the glory and the praise, and we rejoice. And again, we rejoice and say, I rejoice always in the Lord. Thank you for this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.